Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to talk about electronics components, where to buy them, and the options that hobbyists have for purchasing components in small quantity. The limitations might surprise you, but there's a lot of options that we can use to get stuff done. One type of electronics component is an integrated circuit, or IC, and these are made up of many transistors in one silicon die. Creating an integrated circuit requires a lot of specialization and involves a process called doping where atoms are inserted into the lattice structure of silicon or another semiconductor material to change the properties of the material to make it more or less conductive. The result is a piece of semiconductor material that naturally has a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other. The band where these two regions meet and carries no net charge is called the depletion region. In the most simple case of doping, a single PN junction becomes a diode. Check out one of our previous videos for more detail where we did a deeper dive on silicon diodes. In fact, this process of doping is so specialized that for some commodity components like the 3904 transistor, or a simple diode, the piece of doped semiconductor material that creates the device for every manufacturer of component comes from the same factory. And then these transistors are laser etched for whatever manufacturer, like on semiconductor ST micro or NXP, is selling the part to you. This needs to happen because these simple devices made of a single junction or a single transistor, they're just so cheap. When a part is sold for fractions of a penny in large quantity, volume manufacturing needs to be leveraged in order to make any profit selling these devices. That said, complex devices make more profit and are more customized. So for example, micros, memory devices, or computer chipsets, those can be sold for significantly more than the semiconductor device raw cost. So for those components, there can and are significant differences in the silicon from one brand to another or one part to another. Sometimes, each manufacturer like TI, Cypress, or Microchip, they may even have their own factory for creating some of the more specialized silicon dyes in their components, and that's a way that they can protect their intellectual property, but it's also very likely that they design their silicon and contract another company to manufacture at least some of their semiconductor devices. Complicating matters even more, it's possible to design a silicon die to allow for configuration after the initial manufacturing. What I mean is that when you buy a complex component like a microcontroller, computer processor, GPU, or memory device, there may be no difference between the silicon manufactured for the best or worst component available in that series. That's right, the 256 gigabyte memory might be using the same hunk of silicon as the 128 gigabyte memory. This seems wasteful or deceptive, but it's necessary. Why? Two major reasons. Every time the silicon needs to change for a device, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars that needs to be invested to get that silicon manufacturing line reconfigured for the new part. Also, the defect rate when doping silicon wafers is ridiculous. If a memory device has a bad section after manufacturing, being able to laser etch or program the device to ignore the regions with defects on the wafer that allows it to be reused in a lower tier part or a different part. And this process of testing and reconfiguring devices based on their capability is commonly known as binning. That plays a huge role in keeping costs reasonable for semiconductor devices. Now that's not to say that binning doesn't allow manufacturers of parts to charge more for their highest tier of parts, or that they don't make more money because of binning, but it definitely helps everyone involved, the manufacturer, designer, and the end customer to save money and maximize profit. Wait, I thought we were talking about where to buy electronics components. Why are we talking about semiconductor devices, binning, and manufacturing defects? Well. Where to buy electronics components depends on where you are in the supply chain. Technically, even for manufacturers of silicon dyes, they need to buy their components somewhere. Fair point, but I still think you're wasting everyone's time. All right, all right, let's get a move on. From my perspective, where you buy your electronics components depends on what you consider to be a component. For those who make silicon dyes, resistors, or capacitors, the raw materials that go into the components that make what we consider to be ICs, or transistors, or capacitors, could be what you're buying. And I have no idea where to buy ceramic powder, refined silicon, or the carbon used in resistors. 
For the ICs, transistors, and other parts that I consider an electronic component, I know where to find these. That said, my perspective is, unfortunately, not the only perspective in the universe, and some people may consider an assembled circuit board or even an entire electromechanical product like a computer, phone, or GPS to be an electronics component. <clears throat> not, not that there's anything wrong with that. From my point of view, we're talking about electronics components that can be purchased. Let's say purchased online, because if I have to pick up a phone and talk to a real human being, I might implode. In this case, there are two paths that can be explored, buying directly from manufacturers or buying from manufacturers through distributors. Buying directly from a manufacturer is great because you can save a lot of money by not paying someone to buy components and then sell them to you. But let's be honest, Fache isn't really interested in selling John Doe 15 resistors, but a lot of distributors are. Let's take a moment to mention a few manufacturers and distributors to make sure we're on the same page. To name a few manufacturers, Texas Instruments, Microchip, Fache, on semiconductor, there are so many different manufacturers of electronic components and many of these manufacturers supply similar types of components. Usually, component selection comes down to who can provide the product for cheaper and personal preference of a designer for a particular product line. On the record, I'm not sponsored by any particular distributor or manufacturer and I have no professional ties to any of these companies. These are just a few names that popped into my head as players in the electronics industry. Distributors then. It comes to a surprise to nobody that I like the work that DigiKey does. They love the hobbyist and supply tons of components in small quantity for the little guys like you and me. I buy a lot of parts from them and have had no quality issues with them so far. Mauser is in a similar boat and to be honest, I don't know why I don't use Mauser more often. I've found their stock of inductors is usually a little better than DigiKey, but the pricing between the two is, well, kind of a wash and I think I just got used to the parametric search options on DigiKey's site and stuck with them. Jameco also does good work, and LCSC was called out in a recent EEV blog video as having stock of some Chinese manufacturers that we might otherwise not have access to, but ultimately, this is a lot like components. Buy from whichever distributor can provide the best price for what you want to buy, and at the quantity you want to buy it. Buying 50,000 of a part from DigiKey probably won't get you the best price, but buying 50 of a part from a manufacturer will be a huge pain. This isn't meant to be a recommendation to use one vendor over another or to buy from distributors versus manufacturers, but rather just mention some of the options available for people just getting into hobbyist electronics or designing circuits. I don't want you to be overwhelmed with the options available and just throw your hands up in the air. But as long as we're talking about distributors, I've used McMaster Car as a distributor for mechanical components before, and they're pretty sweet. They've got a great variety. Since I'm not putting the EE for Everyone stamp of approval on any of these companies, I acknowledge that you might be looking for some actionable advice. As an example, let's say you're looking for a part and you don't really know where to start looking. Where should you look for a place to look? A service like Octopart could be a really great place to start. They allow you to search for a component across a variety of distributors, then try to find the best part and where to buy it for a good price using their parametric search. That said, this is a free service, so be vigilant. They need to be making their money from somewhere, and that is probably sponsored search results, so they might have ulterior motives to give you search results that are not truly the best price. I hope this video helped you to understand where electronics components come from, where to find them, and just generally demystify the supplier selection process for a hobbyist. Subscribe to be notified of our future videos where we will continue designing and building our uninterruptible power supply. If this video showed you something new, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye.